purposes of presentation. And the judges do have to base their mark on something more tangible than just taste. They have a set of rules, and it says right here, the following must be considered. Harmonious composition of the program as a whole and its conformity with music chosen. They both had that. Easy movement and sureness and time to music. They both had that. Originality. For me, that one goes to Alvis. Expression of the character of the music. They both had that. So I think it all came down to the next three points. Carriage and style, speed, and utilization of the area. Upon breaking down the two programs, it was clear that Alexei's body line was more classically refined, and he skated with more speed and flow. Alvis's program seemed slower in comparison, and most significantly, it had seven full stops compared to Alexei's four. The stops and the slow skating before and after greatly affected his speed and also his utilization of the ice. The judges begin to interpret these stops as rests rather than creative choreography. That's why the judges, except one, placed Alvis behind Alexei. Alvis was given three second places, four third places, and one fifth from the Russian judge. Which leads me to the subjective element. How do you judge artistry? Is a Picasso better than a Rembrandt? We all have our opinions, and they're always subjective. In order for any art form to continue to develop, we must be open to change. In my final analysis, my vote would still have gone with Alvis. His physical and mental power far outweighed what I thought was a well-skated but traditional and unremarkable program from Alexei. So what can we expect from Alvis and Alexei this year? Both men are holding their ground with no compromise. Alvis continues to pioneer, skating to 1492 Conquest of Paradise. Alexei remains classic. He's skating to Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake and Romeo and Juliet. Both men continue to improve artistically, which means the debate will continue. But that's what makes figure skating exciting. The dynamics of a world-class team. The coaches behind Elvis when we return to skate. Skate is brought to you by Dodge Caravan and Plymouth. The purest of all jumps, I feel, is the single axle. There's something about flying and that suspension in the air that I can feel with a single axle, particularly a delayed axle. And ever since I was a kid, I always loved that feeling of just hovering in the air and defying gravity. The difference between a single axle and a double axle is just one revolution. A lot of people ask, what should we do different? The answer is nothing. And the real key to this jump is the preparation. It's position, it's flow, and it's keeping the momentum going. This year, a single, a double, and stay tuned next year. We'll have a triple, I promise. When Brian Orser was an amateur, his coaching team was headed up by Doug Lee, and his choreographer was Ushi Kessler. Buoyed perhaps by Orser's success, Kessler and Lee still work together, and their skaters like Elvis Stoiko are still winning championships. Ushi also works with Shailen Bourne and Victor Kratz, plus German champ Tanya Shevchenko, while Doug coaches British champion Stephen Cousins and works with Eric Milo of France. Right now, let's meet the team of Lee and Kessler. I think he knows what he wants. All right, one triple axel. Let's go. It can be done. We will do it. He has a clear picture of where he's going. Hold center of balance. Look at the, how that right toe is working. And that's what we've been waiting for. And most of all, he's willing to do what he takes to get the skater to where they want to go. You know what to do. That's not a problem. All right? You know exactly what to do. And that when you're top, you feel very aware. This is where I want to be. This is what I want to be. This is how it's going to connect. I have an understanding how his technique works, and he has an understanding 
for what I do. And because of that, the things overlap, they blend. It's just like colors, they blend. But we are not ever doing the other's job. Ushi is a one of a kind. They made the mold and broke it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she has an energy system that just keeps running and running and running. And some th sometimes you just think she's going to fall over and probably pass out. She works with uh, Victor and Shay, and she works with Elvis and works with so many other international skaters that she's a very busy lady. She gives it all. She gives it all, she gives it all the time. You keep people interested because they're now, a picture is forming, they're with you. Yes, I have an eye for what I want to see on the overall picture, but uh, my strength is, is technical and I uh, don't pretend that I'm the magic of some, something else. In parenting, you need two people to do it successfully. And you need to have different perceptions at the same thing, so the skater or the person can form their own perception. And I think that's where uh, this partnership has worked so well, that the skater is allowed to be I an individual. I believe you don't do brain surgery by yourself, so it, it, it takes everyone to really make the thing tick. At one point, Doug had said, you know, a brain surgeon doesn't operate alone. And he really lives that, and I, that's what I admire so much. They met and collaborated in 1981. Their first skater became world champion. What I needed for Mushi was someone my style. What was so great with Doug, Doug Lee and I is that we, had, we, we always communicated. And if there was a problem he had with me, he would tell me, and vice versa. Each person has their own personality. And you want to bring that personality out because that's where you're going to find an artistic side. If you want to turn it around and call it an artistic side, it's people believing in themselves and allowing what that is to come out. Oh. In order to, to really be believable, you have to speak from your heart. You have to skate from your heart. And if you skate from your heart, it is the way you want to do it, not the way I say you should do it. You're painting, it's God painting a picture. See, skating allows you to express yourself just like I think God expresses himself by painting a sunset. It's a living thing. And you have to appreciate it as it's happening because it's gone afterwards. That's what life is all about. That's what skating's all about. That's about getting your abilities out of you. Uh, and I think that's what we do the best. This man knows everything. <laughs> Because nothing is guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. That's all, folks. <laughs> please, please, please. That's all, folks. <laughs> It's not over yet, Elvis. The kids put their whole selves into it. When we return to skate, right after this. Say, my name is Vincent. One of the marks of greatness is having such a command of the sport that it seems effortless. Game champions giving everything they've got. The World Figure Skating Championships this week on CBC. A little tip for watching the world is to keep an eye on some of skating's young stars. Many of them made strong first impressions at the World Junior Championships last November in Budapest, especially the Russians who swept that competition, and particularly Ilya Kulik, who also won Europeans just a few weeks ago. There's a whole new wave, so watch the young talent. One of the more intricate and compelling elements of figure skating is rules, especially rules that change and shape the nature of various disciplines. The subject of this show's editorial is one of my personal favorites, ice dancing, so this better be good. Here with a special viewpoint on my favorite sport is Taller Cranston. Taller? Thanks, Tracy. Here's a good one for you. Have you heard about the ice dancers that are being killed? Well, they're not being killed literally, but the dead wood in the ISU that make up the rules are really stifling creativity in ice dance. Let's go back to Lilyhammer. No, 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 not the Lilyhammer with Nancy and Tanya, and not the Lilyhammer that G. Elvis should have won, but rather the ice dance competition. Memorable? Not really. Torval and Dean made a kind of a splash with exhuming a program 
that had all their golden hits. But the winners, ah, you see, you didn't even remember the winners' names. Grischalk and Platov. You didn't remember them because they didn't do anything new, and the rules prevented them from doing that. The ISU was outraged in 1991 when Izzat, similar to her brother, and Marina Klimova, a future Olympic champion, actually wore green makeup and red eyeshadow. They hated it. I loved it. Come on, guys. This is almost the year 2000. Let's put on a show. Let's give the people what they want. And that green makeup? I'm thinking about using some of it myself. Might perk up my life. How about you? <laughs> I don't think it'll perk up my life. And I don't know if green makeup will help ice dancing, but I do agree with you. The rules are stifling the sport. And I know ice dancing needs rules, but perhaps they could have more technical requirements. And artistically, I think they should just leave it up to the ice dancers. Let the ice dancers lead the sport. Thanks for coming, Taller. That's all for this edition of Skate. Make sure you catch all the action from the 1995 World Figure Skating Championships in England. Next time, we'll have a special feature on Michael Schmirken, Israel's one-man Winter Olympic team. Our final show for the season will be informative and, as always, plenty of fun. So please be here next time for Skate. I'm Tracy Wilson. See you then, everybody.